household that Tarawad has been a Tarawad of very strong women. I mean, for one thing, we didn't have any practice of sambandham in that house, at least for the last five, six generations. There's no known case of sambandham. And the women all continue to live there and actually manage the house and the fields and everything. They were not dependent on their brothers, as was the case, unfortunately, in many, many Nair households. It was the brothers who not only controlled everything and the property, but they also controlled the lives of their sisters. And they are the ones who encouraged sambandham and various other awful practices. But at least I know that from my great-grandmother's time and her mother before that, all the women, matriarchs of Anakara Varakar, they were very strong and they controlled things. And my own great-grandmother, I remember, and uh, she was also, uh, you know, strong lady. She, during 1921, she was staying there. And of course, it's part of Malabar, just near where the whole, uh, you know, Mapla revolt was taking place. And there's a story that she was thinking of leaving and going to Madras. But uh, there were some Mapla gentlemen who worked there. And they came and said, no, please don't leave. And they said, we will uh, protect you. And so there was this, imagine, that was a place, of course, there was no electricity. It was the middle of forest. And there's this Nair woman living alone with two Mapla men sleeping outside her room to protect her. It was incredible. And she was not bothered about what people would say. She was happy that they were ready to protect her. And after that, the story is that all the Maplas in that area, they had a meeting in the mosque and they wrote a letter and sent it to Nilambur and said, please don't cross the Bharatapura river and come here because we are very peaceful here. And they didn't, that, that happened, nobody came to say. So from that you can imagine that she was a strong woman. My grandmother Amu Swaminathan was very young when she got married. But anyway, there are many stories about that marriage, I won't take up your time. But she became very involved in the freedom movement as a young uh, mother and in uh, Madras. And her husband died when she was only 30, but he was also very progressive. So she continued being active when she was, uh, uh, she was an MLA, and then she was a member of the Constituent Assembly and she went to jail and then she became Lok Sabha MP and Rajya Sabha MP. And what is more important for me is that she was a great supporter of Dr. Ambedkar in the Constituent Assembly. She was a member of the Select Committee on the Hindu Code Bill and she made a very important speech supporting him and condemning those people who were opposing the reforms that he was uh, trying to present before that. So she, has, she was always a great fighter for women's rights, for family planning against dowry, against so many of the social, you know, I would say criminal practices. And she remained a fighter for all these things all her life. And uh, then my mother, who grew up in Madras, Lakshmi, she was a doctor. And uh, she left Madras and went to Singapore. She didn't want to work for the British government as a doctor. And over there, she was practicing medicine, treating the poor people, migrants and all that. And then she was there at the airstrip when Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose landed. And uh, he knew her mother and so he was happy to meet her. And after two days, he was talking about this women's regiment that he wanted to start. And they all, all everybody said, it's impossible, it can't happen. So he said, you call that lady doctor. So my mother went and he said to her and she immediately agreed and said, I'm ready to join, I'm ready to work. So he said, what about your practice? He said, I'm, she said, I'm locking up my uh, clinic tonight. So she went and locked up her clinic and she cut her hair. She felt that as a soldier, she would not be able to look after this long hair. So she cut her hair and reported for duty the next day. And then, of course, they got involved in the recruitment. And that was so inspiring that these young girls from poor families, very lower middle class families from all over Southeast Asia of Tamil and Kerala uh, origin. They are the ones who volunteered. They were not from the so-called martial races, you know. And uh, they volunteered. They had never seen India. 
their great grandparents had come as migrants because they felt inspired by the fight for Indian freedom. And so they joined, leaving their homes, leaving their husbands. They were trained, they were ready to die for the independence of India. But independent India didn't do much for them, I must say. Many of them couldn't even come back to India. And very many of them, nobody knew what happened to them. So that was Captain Lakshmi, who remained you know, in the service of people all her life. She was very active, for example, in the 84 riots. She stood in front of a clinic where a lot of Sardars lived with a chappal in her hand and she said, if anybody comes, you know, she was quite amazing, fearless woman. And she remained a doctor of the poor and then, you know, she contested for president. She became one of the founders of Aidwa. She joined the CPIM. Mm. So she continued till her last day to serve people and to fight for, you know, people's, people's rights, women's rights and people's rights.